The cave was dark. Our only light source, a dying torch, whose flames danced across the murky water that covered the floor. Just as our eyes had adjusted to their new surroundings, a flash of light came from the ceiling above. Blinded, we did our best to brace for combat, tightly gripping steel and staff, readying ourselves for whatever was approaching, prepared to face whatever creature was now stirring in the waters all around us. Welcome to a brand new episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old creatures from past editions of Dungeons and Dragons and bring them to light for use in your current 5th edition campaign. I am your host Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we are going to be talking about a creature from the 1st edition Fiend Folio that eventually made its way into Pathfinder actually. The Blindheim is a human-sized frog-like creature whose eyes can grow wide and illuminate the area in front of it like two giant spotlights. This creature can be a great addition to any low or mid-tier games and have a ton of story potential and different uses outside of combat. But that said, in combat they can be a true menace and they offer some unique challenges you don't find many other places. So today we're going to talk about what they can do in battle, some changes I've made to the original creatures that I think makes them a bit more interesting, and of course some plot hooks and ways that you can actually use them in your game. So first things first though, let's get an overview of... The Blindheim relies mostly on stealth and hit and run tactics. They're very good at staying out of sight and they're extremely quiet so they tend to use that to their advantage. They're also quite mobile with a 30 foot move speed which is pretty standard but they have a 20 foot climb and swim speed meaning that they're going to be able to get all over the sides and ceilings of any cave walls as well as navigating between underwater passages or anything like that that might exist. It should be no surprise that these creatures are prone to living in swamps so they can use the full range of different environments you'll find in a swamp such as watery and murky areas to their advantage. They of course have a claw and bite attack which is pretty standard fare for a creature like this. They do have multi attack as well so they can do one of each on their turn. And those two attacks combined tend to do pretty decent damage, it's about what you'd expect from a CR3 creature. And as I briefly mentioned where they do live in the swamp, that has also granted them the resistance to poison that they have. I imagine just because they're exposed to different poisonous agents such as fungus and mold, that kind of thing on the daily, they have built up some sort of resistance to that. And the other thing that helps them out in combat with their tracking and stealthy nature is that they have keen senses, so they roll with advantage on perception checks that rely on hearing or on smell. Now onto its signature ability and where this creature gets its name from, we have a trait called Blinding Gaze. Essentially, the blind time has the ability to emit a 30 foot cone of bright light, which extends another 30 feet into dim light, that it can turn on and off pretty much at a moment's notice. The rationale here is that it has a second sort of eyelid that it can open and close whenever it chooses to that will cause its eyes to emit this light or turn it off essentially. The reason this is so useful in combat is because if they have this light turned off, at a moment's notice they can jump out at their enemy and turn on this light, thus blinding them. Now of course that creature who is then exposed to the sudden flash of bright light makes a dexterity save, and if they make it, they're immune to being blinded for the rest of the day, but if they fail that save, they are completely blind for one hour. And in the middle of combat, that is a huge detriment to you and your party. Obviously not being able to see is never a good thing, but from a mechanical perspective, essentially what that means is you have disadvantage on any attack rolls you make against anything, and anything that's trying to attack you has advantage because you can't see them. You also automatically fail any saves or ability checks that rely on sight, that's kind of secondary in this combat, but if you wanted to pair a blind time with another creature that has some kind of save it imposes that relies on sight, it would be pretty nasty. Now the other thing is, even if that creature does make their save, any creature who's attacking a blind time that is within that 30 foot cone of light does so with disadvantage, because while you might not be totally blinded, it's still hard to look directly at the blind time who is emanating this massive source of light. So at worst, it's going to make them harder to hit, which is never a bad thing for the creature in question. Now granted, that does only operate in a 30 foot cone, so it's very important to establish, especially if you're using a grid, which direction the blind time is looking in. So if that creature has a way to get behind the blind time or into its proverbial blind spot, then it's going to be able to attack normally. And this is where if you have multiple blind times in battle and they can kind of cover each other's spots with their blinding light, it's going to become very useful. They are also immune to being blinded, so they can look at one another without having to worry about blinding each other, which is important in most situations. This eye light does have a hidden benefit as well that is not directly mechanical, so to speak. 
These frog-like creatures don't actually speak any language, but they have developed a method of communication that relies on blinking light patterns and small gestures. So this means in the middle of battle, not only are the players not going to be able to understand what these creatures are communicating to each other, but they're going to be able to convey a very high amount of information to one another in a very short amount of time. And not only do these creatures not speak a language, but they tend to be completely silent even in the middle of combat. Again, this lends to their stealthy nature and the fact that they're quite hard to detect, especially in their own native environment. This total silence and this flashing light pattern method of communication can lend itself to a very eerie and atmospheric fight. Just imagine if these things ambushed a party in a dark, swampy cave, and that party is now trying to contend with them, and there's lights flashing everywhere, and they don't really understand what's going on. It's just a good setting for a battle, I think. It's not only confusing, disorienting, and strange, but I think it would create a very memorable encounter that the players would always talk about. Another bonus about this method of communication is that it can also be done from a very long distance. Similar to the way that Navy ships might use floodlights to communicate via patterns over incredible distances on the water, as long as these creatures can see each other, they can do the same thing over miles potentially. And this also might lend itself to a few interesting plot hooks, which we'll get into in a little bit, but first I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some... So for the changes I made to this creature, I didn't actually make them to the base creature, I just kind of included a little addendum to the stat block itself. I figured since they live in a swamp and they are frogs, it's very likely that there might be a version of this creature that is poisonous. So this poisonous version of this creature is not only resistant to poison, but it's actually completely immune to poison damage and immune to being poisoned and their bite can also cause the poison condition on a failed save. And I also gave them an ability called Noxious Cloud that allows them to emit kind of an aura of poisonous gas that can cause some poison damage and cause other creatures to become poisoned. It's nothing too, too insane, but it just adds a little extra kick to these creatures if you want them to be a bit stronger. And maybe you have a kind of clan leader who is one of these poisonous frogs, whereas the other ones are all just kind of normal, and that separates them from the rest a little bit. If you do use this variant, it's only going to bump their CR up by one, so it's not going to make things too imbalanced if you're worried about that. But uh, yeah, just kind of something extra you can choose to add on if you so desire. So I think that about sums up these guys in battle. Now let's move on and talk about some. So my first thought when it comes to these creatures is how would people react that maybe live nearby and saw the lights flashing in the swamp? Say you have a village that either is in or borders a swamp, and you had these lights that were mysteriously flashing through the mist that is kind of always veiling the swampy areas nearby. In popular folklore, you might think that's a will-o'-wisp or some other kind of ghostly spirit trying to lead people astray into the swamp. And playing on that preconceived notion from what we know about fables, or at least the popular ones, your party might come to the same conclusion. Maybe the truth behind the matter is, is that these wisps are actually blindheim that are just communicating with each other across the swamp, so when they go in to investigate it, they don't find ghosts, but instead find these monstrous frog-like creatures. And who knows, maybe at some point some organization like a mercenary company was even able to domesticate one or two of these creatures, and they use them as floodlights, maybe to guard their outposts, or even to communicate, like those old navy ships did back in the day, from across mountain ranges or as some kind of warning signal. I mean, the possibilities for what they could actually use this technology for are endless, because you essentially have a spotlight in the medieval age, which is not something to be taken lightly. And while you might be able to achieve a similar or even greater effect with magic, to a common mercenary band, something like this would be very useful. Especially when you consider the blinding aspect of it. Because they would be useful not only as a tool, but as also a weapon, kind of like a flash grenade to stun people while the rest of the soldiers come in and take care of business. And if you wanted to forgo the whole bestial nature of this creature and actually make them more intelligent, you could use one of these creatures as a pretty memorable NPC. I can imagine a blind time making a very interesting pirate captain or even the leader of a mercenary band. Or if you just have monstrous NPCs in your game, maybe just an interesting member of some kind of organization, whatever you have going on in your world. Ultimately, I also think they just make a great random encounter for any swampy, hazy area where vision isn't completely clear. And going back to that thing about the lights in the swamp, maybe they try to actually kind of act as will-o'-wisps and lure adventurers off the path into the swamp where they can then ambush them. They'd also make excellent minions for a witch who might live in the swamp, and they kind of go out into the world and do her bidding for her, and maybe try to bring people back to her hut to strike up a deal or 
whatever it is that you need a witch in your game to do. So ultimately that is everything I've got for these creatures this week. Hopefully you found this video informative and helpful and hopefully you have a spot in your game for these fantastic creatures that are often overlooked because the art from the original book is kind of goofy, but they actually are really cool and interesting creatures. If you have a story about a time that you've used these creatures in the past, or maybe had them used on you as a player, please tell me about it in the comments below, I'd love to hear it. And also, if you've got a recommendation for creatures you'd like to see me cover on this channel in the future, you can drop a comment about that, or let me know on our Discord server as well, the link to which you can find in the description below. And while you're down there, you'll see all of our other social media stuff, such as Reddit, Patreon, all that good stuff. And of course, if you are interested in supporting the channel, honestly, the the best way to do that is to simply subscribe. I've got at least one new video every week and we're starting to come up on the end of the busy season in my life with my real job towards the end of April. So hopefully I'll be able to do even more than that as we get into the summer months. Anyways, I just want to thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate it and I will see you in the next video. Till then.